Okay. All right. So, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the June 2021 Raleigh Astronomy Club Imaging Meeting. Uh, today, the uh, topic is uh, uh, your favorite or most used uh, scope, where everybody will just give us give us a small little basic tour of the telescope that they have uh, that they would like to show why it's their favorite, what they've uh, done with it uh, as far as bells and whistles go, and uh, then show off some results that they have taken with it. Uh, one of the things I hope that everybody who's going to present uh, tonight, uh, of whatever scope that they uh, are going to be talking about, is that they'll show their uh, first light photo of that scope. If not, then that's no big deal, but uh, it's always uh, nice to see uh, what was the first thing you looked at? And then also, uh, as you go down the line, showing off the other pictures that you've taken with the scope, how much uh, you've improved with your processing or uh, just, you know, basic uh, uh, techniques in the hobby. So uh, let me see. Uh, uh, John, John Davis, uh, do you think you can go first? Sure. Yeah. Let me uh, see if I can handle the screen share and stuff. All right. Can everybody see that? Beautiful. Okay, good. Well, I'm going to talk about my uh, eight inch Richie Critian. Um, this is not my, like I said, while I got it, this is not my first scope, but it's the first scope that I bought when I got back into uh, astronomy and, and imaging back in about 2014. Uh, I did not wasn't a part of the astronomy club, so I didn't talk to anybody. I read a little bit and and promptly went out and bought probably all the wrong stuff to start out with because I started out with an eight inch eight inch scope, a scope that has some challenges with collimation, and I put it on a an AVX Celestron AVX mount, which was not capable, not a tremendous mount to guide on, and certainly probably a challenge with a big scope like this so so I did everything all wrong but then over the years it's it's kind of I've gotten the hang of collimation a little bit and I've gotten some some things done to it that um, I, I'm happy with the kind of images it's turning out now and uh, it, it's not my only scope but it's certainly one I like to use a lot so um, you can see it's an astrotech it's just a a garden variety. It's it's got a steel uh, tube. Doesn't have any of the fancy carbon tube or anything. So um, so it's really pretty much just a vanilla uh, scope. Uh, the first thing I was talking about, uh, you know, with collimation, that that took a while to figure out, and uh, I probably it probably was pretty well collimated when I got it, and I probably tried to tweak it and messed it up, and then it took me a while to to learn how to get it back. Uh, I don't have any pictures of them, but I, I, I bought some of the uh, collimation tools from Howie Gladder. Is that the way you say his name? Is that right? Uh, anyway, yeah, he's, 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 well, he's, he's, pa he's passed away now, but he, he made some really, really uh, precision uh, collimation tools. And uh, I, I bought his, his laser collimator and a couple of other gadgets that he had. And that really helped me learn to do a pretty good job of collimating it, getting it close, so then you can go out and, and do the final star collimation in the field, and it, it worked out pretty well. So at any rate, and I, I, I've gotten it, it's, it's stayed pretty well in collimation since the, you know, for the last couple of years, um, since I got it dialed in pretty well. It's not perfect, you know, if you pixel peep at the edges, you'll, you'll see it's not perfect, but, you know, it's it's good enough for me. Uh, one That's of the things true. I did, uh, one of the the first, you know, this thing came with a a stock focuser and all that kind of stuff. So one of the first things that I did upgrade on it, and I'll show you this first. Is this? Uh, can y'all see my mouse? Yeah. You see the yeah. mouse there? Yeah. Okay. This uh, this ring is a uh, is to help collimation. The, you know, one of the problems with these cheap uh cheaper rc scopes is that the the focuser is attached to the the mirror cell so whatever you do to try to get the make sure that your focuser is parallel or to your uh, or is aligned with your image your your image train uh 
whatever you do to, to adjust that uh, can mess up the rest of the collimation. So I added this uh, gadget that came from uh, the company that made the scope that lets you adjust the, the uh, focuser independent of the, the, the rest of the, the mirror cell when you're trying to collimate. So, um, so that was one thing I did. Uh, then the uh, next thing I did was upgrade to a, a, a moonlight focuser uh, with the with the uh, stepper motor controller, so that I could you know do uh, automatic focusing um, uh, rather than being stuck with manual focusing. And also, I think this is just generally a smoother, much better, uh, obviously focuser than the stock one that that came with it. Although what that wasn't a terrible focuser. Um, so so I did that within a year of really getting going on this on the scope. Um, the next thing I did was invest in a, in a uh, compressor uh, from astrophysics so that I could knock it down from, uh, from F8 to, you know, usually I run it at 70% at, uh, uh, reduction so that I get F5, 6. Um, so it really helps with a lot with your, you know, composition and being able to get uh, long enough subs, you know, tracking is easier and just a lot of things that that, that, that helped out with the, uh, with the quality of the images. So John, I've got a Let's question see. here. Yes. Uh, so okay. uh, we're looking at the, uh, your total compared to Astrophysics. What's that little thing to the uh, right of it? says so the RU SFE and 48V-5, what is that exactly? That um, or? That's just a, it's just a space, just a spacer. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm trying to figure out. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the scope is to the left and the cameras to the right. So I was, I have to get just the right spacing between the back of the compressor and the, and the sensor to be able to get a particular amount of, uh, of reduction, you know, and so I had to get there, you know, but the all past this is the, you know, you've got the, the OAG and I've got the filter wheel and then the camera. So, uh, you know, I went through and did all the math and, and to get a 0.7 uh, compression, you know, you had to have the certain amount of meters of distance. So that was just to get the right the right spacing. So it, you know, whatever I had, it, it took a five millimeter spacer in the last spot to, to get the right distance. So that's all that is, is nothing, nothing, nothing uh, active in that, in that section. So is that what you want to know? Yeah, that's good enough. Hello. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. 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 All right. So then the next thing I did was originally, you know, I had cables running, all kinds of cables running down off of the scope down to, uh, to all the devices that were mounted on the tripod. So I built myself a little wooden box and I mounted everything there. I mounted the, the, uh, the view controller and this is the focus controller for the moonlight focuser. Then I've got a, I've got a, a StarTech uh, powered hub there, and then I've got uh, on the other side of an Anderson power pole uh, power distribution bus so that I can you know, run everything from the devices on the scope to this box. And then I've only got one, one cable coming off with, uh, with power and, and data coming back down to the, to the ground and over to the, to my laptop. So um, that, that just eliminated a whole lot of uh, potential cable snags. Um, and now that my, my mount has a, the ability to run the, those, the data and the, and the power through the, through the shafts of the mount, uh, it really is nice because you basically have totally eliminated any opportunity to snag anything. Uh, the focuser so, really needs five amps? Huh? Do what? 
The focus here really needs five amps. Wow, that's more than that. No, probably, probably, probably not. I don't remember now. I don't know what I where I was going with that, but okay. it's probably less than that because I don't pull. I don't pull. I was doing a test the other day because I just now have ordered a a, a lithium iron phosphate battery. And I was double checking to see how much power I pull. And I think my, the whole thing mount and everything only pull, pulls less than three amps when it's running. So okay. yeah, so there's the, the view controller is the thing that, that, uh, you know, and that may be what I did was I put what this runs back to the battery and there's actually another, uh, there was another power distribution thing on the on the battery whenever I used to run individual power cables, and that may be where I just what uh, fuse was in that particular channel. So no, I probably could crank, crank these crank these down a good bit. Um, hey John, I had a question. Sure. Uh, one. Uh, so if if a beginner was interested in a longer focal length scope, how would you rate this as beginner friendly or intermediately friendly? I would say it's it's an an intermediate, just because I would say intermediate, just because of the you know the collimation can you know be a challenge for you. I, if if I was to be honest, if I was doing it over again after having been around the club and talking to everybody. I probably would have gone the route of a of a Newtonian, like, kind of like you got, like you have, okay. you know, a, yeah. a fast Newtonian, you know, just because of, you know, the, that particular aspect of it, you know, it's uh, um, well, it's nice are... because it because it is, it's pretty easy to balance everything, you know, you don't have a long tube, you don't have, you know, from that standpoint, it it really does have some advantages. Um, but I would definitely say it's an it's a an intermediate level uh, scope for for people. You know? Yeah, the Newtonian. I would so after I bought this one, that category because the thing about a Newtonian is that's very challenging back focus. Whereas this thing, uh, you have about six feet of back focus from looking at your yeah. <laughs> image. So this is true. This is true. Uh, you know, so yeah, it, it really is. <laughs> it is easy from that standpoint. I you know it. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I say that about the Newtonian, but I haven't worked with one, so I don't know what the challenges are with it. I yeah, I, I played with one of these stuff. for about three months and uh, gave up because for at least my my particular, I loved it when it was collimated. It was great. And with that, mm -hmm. that astrophysics mm -hmm. reducer is amazing. Um, but uh, I found no matter how yeah. hard I tightened the primary, it was, if I flipped the scope, the collimation would shift. And that may have just been oh, my wow. particular instance was just not Your well instrument. done, um, but I, I was frustrated because yeah. I really loved it. Otherwise, it was really uh, fast and had great image quality. Yeah, I mean, like I say, I I haven't noticed it doing that. It seems to, have, you know, done pretty well. Cool, uh, that's great for me. I'll show I'll show you a couple of couple of pictures that are you know fairly recent, and so um, I haven't noticed any problems with that with this one. So. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, you know, you, you go out on cloudy nights and you start reading and you, you see all kinds of, you know, horror stories and stuff, you know, but I didn't see that before I bought mine, but uh, perfect. You know, I'm just, I, for the moment, I'm, it's everything's cooking good. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm hoping it'll stay that way. <laughs> now, I will, I will tell you an interesting thing. You know, I just bought this box here. You see all the parts on it. I just bought a uh I'm, I'm building i bought built a a rig that's for, that's portable using one of the uh one of those little portable mounts the the uh oh shoot i'm drawing a blank on the name of it now um but one is one of the two it's an ioptron you know one of those little portable mounts and i bought one of those uh pegasus uh boxes that has all of this capability built into it in one box so you've got this little box that's about a, an inch thick and about five by five uh dimensions and it but it costs about 600 bucks and uh i thought wow you know gonna spend that much money on that but then i added up what i spent on the parts that are on this box and 
it's not that much less. So, so I, I, I could necessarily say that I would recommend doing what I've done with this, this, uh, this box versus buying one of those things uh, as your, you know, as your uh, power distribution and control stuff. So, uh, just, just my, if you're, if you're somebody who likes to tinker, this is a really good way to go and I probably spent too much money on some of these parts but uh, but anyway I'm talking too long let me go on let's see what else oh the last thing I've done is uh, I was having trouble with dew on the secondary last year and so I found the these Kendrick the guys in Canada it's a company in Canada that has lots of things dew controllers and that sort of stuff they have this this uh, dew heater that you can attach to the back of your secondary and then you run the wire out and hook it up to your dew controller. So I, I did that uh, earlier this year and it seems to have solved my dew problems. Uh, yeah, so that, that works pretty well. So if, you've, you know, if you're dealing with something like that, I know they make them for Newtonians, they make them for you know, for RC scopes. John, do you, well, do you so. use a dew shield? I, I have not been using okay, a yeah, I, that, I probably that, need that to would do help that too. So. Because more than anything, that would help you with the uh, off-axis uh, light you can get. There's a gap between the oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the secondary that if you go at the right place uh -huh. and there's a bright star there, it'll blow up everything. And the, uh, the dew shield right. will help reduce that possibility also but cool yeah. that's good you got this working um definitely kendrick has some yeah, good things. yeah it, it's, it's pretty neat it was uh it was you know and it wasn't too terribly expensive so all right so that's that's most of the things that i've done to it uh i'll show you this is whoops oh this is the best thing i ever did to it and that was by a really really good mount i, I bought a second hand uh ap mac one uh, about this time last year and that's been the best the best addition to it i know that kind of is a stretching it a bit but you know the mount the mount is such an important part of any of this stuff. So, all right so pictures uh this is not actually the very first light because when i first bought it i went out first time i ever went out i just uh stuck my 35 millimeter camera on the back of it on my avx mount and tried to take pictures with uh, without any guiding or any of that sort of stuff. And I think I got a couple of fuzzy out of focus. You know, I didn't have any, I was focusing off the, the LCD on the back of the camera and all that kind of stuff. So I don't have that, but this is uh, from a while ago with, a, with my modified uh, Canon DSLR. Uh, I think that's, yeah, that's M3. So that was from a while ago. Uh, and this is one of the more recent ones, uh, Crab Nebula from maybe last year, early, early, late 2019 or early 2020. And then uh, this is uh, Bubble from last year. Uh, and this one, Mike, you were talking about the collimation stuff. This one's about 40 hours of imaging mm. so there was a bunch of bunch of stuff with with lots of flips over multiple nights so yeah i good. never noticed any real problems so it's it's fairly fairly good all right well that's mine anybody got any questions about that before i pass it on okie doke okay uh i don't know uh let me go ahead and go next um so so do I have my screen up set up here? Yeah, there it is. Okay, share my screen. And that one there. Okay, everybody see that? Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is a, a stellar view of uh, 90 millimeter F7, so 600 uh, millimeter, 630 millimeter uh, uh, focal link. So uh, uh, I was looking to get a, uh, an APO refractor for a little while because all I had done um, actually was uh, just uh, using a, uh, a Newtonian uh, 
F4 8 inch reflector, one that's uh, is pretty much a popular uh, uh, configuration for Newtonians. But anyway, yeah, this is from Stellar View right here. It's in carbon fiber. I was looking for something that was more light than not necessarily holding or uh, being affected by temperature. Uh, I don't know how much of a uh, difference it made, but that was just me being paranoid because you know, I just want to keep everything under control so that uh, the mount I had at the time could uh, handle everything. So that's just the scope by itself. And uh, there's a nice uh, pollen coated uh, uh, front element right there. So you can see the magnetic triple lens and uh, so it's a 90 millimeter. And here's the backside with our first uh, thing I'll talk about is the moonlight, like John Davis uh, pointed out. Moonlight, uh, um, all the uh, aftermarket uh, uh, or third party, whatever you call it, you want to say it, uh, focusers that are out there are one of two things. They're either the moonlight or um, uh, a better touch uh, focuser. So this one, uh, I asked uh, Ron uh, just, to say, uh, just to see if he could uh, uh, make me a, a an unanodized uh, focuser, you know, just like you know, I mean, why don't you just do that? I just wanted something different, and nifty, and uh, so he sent me this one, and I was going off the uh, flame thread that he had listed for all the telescopes that he had made uh, focusers for. Well, when he sent this to me, um, it didn't fit, so I was like, oh well, darn it. And so I told Ron about it, and he said, uh, well, just send it back and send me your. Uh, original focuser and I'll uh, fix it for you. And so I don't know if, if he was just feeling lazy at the time, but he emailed me back and said, hey, I have a two and a half inch one, you can have that. <laughs> so I was like, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I, I apologize, I'm sorry it came to that. But yeah, so anyway, uh, but at first this was just all manual and then I had that step motor added to it uh, right there. And so there's the controller. Um, so uh, Moonlight gives you two options, uh, a, a DC uh, focuser and a, uh, this uh, MIDI controller version two. And uh, uh, that little uh, like uh, camera case, that's what, really what it is. It holds the battery that I use to uh, run it. And so uh, the whole point of this is to make the whole thing stand alone on the uh, actual telescope. So the uh, battery there supplies the power for it. So there's no wires coming off of a that controller to uh, feed it power. And also, uh, was it uh, that, uh, uh, was it RS-232, I think that's what it's called, uh, um, cable coming off the back there, it goes into to the focuser right there. You can see it on the uh, bottom left of the uh, um, uh, motor there, the high, uh, high resolution, resolution step of motor. Uh, but anyway, it runs right there. It's a two foot, uh, or Actually, I think it's maybe three feet. I don't know, but uh, it's a short cable. Uh, basically, it's meant to keep everything on the scope so I don't have any wires running down to it. Ultimately, the only uh, wire that does not uh, go anywhere as far as, uh, well, actually, the only other wire that does uh, go anywhere is the uh, USB, and I just put that into um, the back uh, Z uh, CWO. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, USB hub that they have on all of their cameras these days. And so there's my lovely high-tech dew shield. All it is is just a piece of cardboard that, uh, <laughs> from a cardboard box, and I just wrapped it around a uh, fence post in my backyard to uh, curve it up a little bit and have anything that was the right diameter. And uh, uh, just reinforced it, quote, reinforced it with some uh, duct tape there to make it waterproof. And uh, of course, before I did that, uh, I went inside with just a Sharpie marker to blacken the inside. And it does a really good job. I don't use, uh, I've never had a dew uh, heater system, never had one. Um, so it was just like, well, you know, the next best thing is just to make a really long dew shield. So that thing that you're seeing there is about two, uh, not two feet, wouldn't that be something? Uh, is uh, about one uh, foot in length. And uh, I've never had uh, 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 the lenses fog up on me since I put that on there. I mean, it's just so long, you know, why not? And of course I take the risk of increasing the profile of the actual OTA, put that on there. But since it's so light, the only thing I really have to worry about is if there's going to be any light breezes on the night of imaging. But usually when you have a breeze around like that, you don't really have to worry about dew. So anyway, there's that. And then, uh, well, not all, uh, 
Uh, scopes are perfect, and this is not an FSQ 106 by Takahashi, so uh, I had to get a fill flattener for it, and uh, been using that for quite a while, the Astrotech fill flattener there. Um, and of course, there's a ZWO right there. Right, right after it is a, a spacer, the N42, for two spacer, and it's connected to connected to uh, um, with a star zone uh, filter drawer unit, drawer unit, where you just take out the, the filter or replace it with whatever other wavelength or uh, broadband or light pollution filter you just put it in there. And I believe at the time I took this picture, that's the uh, ASI 183 that I have on the back there. So there's that. Okay, and then other things I have added on to it is I like to do a lot of solar imaging. So here's a Herschel wedge that I got from uh, uh, Luck. Uh, I think it's called Lunt Solar Systems is the name of the company, but anyway, uh, it's a Lunt uh, uh, Herschel Wedge, and uh, it's a really good, uh, nice little uh, all-in-one kind of unit. So uh, I, I was just looking for, uh, I've had two, uh, this is just because I'm so rough with my uh, equipment, I've had two uh, regular Vader film solar filters uh, go bad on me, and that was, like I said, I'm just rough handling their them. So I just went ahead and just got the wedge. It was expensive, but hey, all said and done, right? And so, yeah, to take it to the next level, I do, again, uh, some more of uh, uh, solar imaging uh, accessories. Here's a calcium K-line filter, uh, uh, also made by Lance, made to go after uh, uh, the light of calcium at the K-line. I can't remember what the K is. Uh, maybe somebody can interrupt me and tell me, but, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, it's uh, uh, centered around uh, I think it's 393 nanometers is what that filter uh, is uh, filters for. And uh, calcium K line to me is more interesting than uh, hydrogen alpha. However, uh, I did a time lapse a long time ago just to see what happened. It's nowhere near as dynamic as hydrogen alpha. But uh, one thing about calcium K line, just that little module right there, you can sometimes see uh, uh, prominences. Of course, you're going to need uh, a camera to see it because. Uh, uh, 393 nanometers is uh, really hard to see visually. So that's everything all thrown together right there. There's the uh, uh, my 200 millimeter uh, uh, Canon lens that I throw on top of it for uh, that I use uh, as a guide step. I also use it for imaging. Um, I don't have a focuser for that one yet, so all I do is uh, for guiding, so I don't have to come back, come outside and refocus it. I just stop it down to f10, and usually it just holds the top. Holes right there. Don't have to worry about focusing. But uh, but there uh, uh, is the uh, hand controller for the uh, 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 moonlight focuser right there. So you see everything is all in one. So the uh, USB goes to the cam uh, for, for the uh, focuser. That is the focuser controller. The USB goes to the camera. The RS232, uh, not in this configuration right here because I have it sitting here on my counter. We go to the actual uh, stepper motor, and then that little uh, DC uh, cord that you see there is coming out of that, uh, at that out of that uh, camera case that I use uh, to hold the battery. And so it's all in one; it's all right there. Nothing comes off of it. The only thing that comes off the mount is uh, uh, just the power cord, the main camera, uh, for its cooler, and uh, uh, what is it? Uh, well, the actual USB that goes out and uh, uh, goes to your computer. So here's my first uh, uh, light with it. Uh, I got this, so it's funny, it's, uh, this uh, year uh, marks my 10th uh, year of having this scope. Uh, it's the scope I've owned the longest. So this is Comic Air, and uh, I've got to uh, uh, right before the meeting start, I talked with uh, Mark, because he's the comic guru around here, as some when, when around this was, because I was pretty sure it was 2011 too. Um, I was, I didn't think I had bought the uh, telescope at the end of the, that year. And uh, yeah, that's Comic Garrett right there. Uh, my processing skills were still uh, a work in progress there, but uh, I thought it was pretty cool. That would be the first uh, light would be a comet. So that was pretty unique. Uh, continue to look at that comet as days went by. And uh, I saw Michael Fulbright did this with a, uh, a Newtonian a long time ago. Uh, but Comic Garrett went by the asterism and uh, the constellation signal is called a coat hanger. You've got your coat hanger nebula right here. I don't know what this one is. It's an NGC open cluster of some sort. Uh, but yeah, so uh, this one right here, uh, because I, I was having the hardest time getting it to be in frame, I had to do a uh, 
to pay Mosaic to get that to work. Okay, and you know, these two are, uh, that was with a Rebel uh, T3i, uh, modified by Gary Harness. This is the first Nebula picture I took with it. I took it out here in uh, uh, Apex. I know that was at the end of 2011, definitely. That was at the end of 2011. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, high, the housing crisis had just uh, subsided quite a bit, but not much construction had started on the three uh, housing developments around us. So it was still fairly dark. If anybody lives around in Apex or knows the area of Apex, I'll just say that uh, back in 2011, when this picture was taken, still part of Apex Barbecue Road was uh, dirt. So a little, little, well, 10 years ago, there you go. And uh, this is my first narrow band image with it, uh, Bubble Nebula, not too different from uh, what John did there. This is with a, uh, an ATIC 428EX, only 2.8 megapixels. I was just getting my feet wet just to see if uh, I would want to do narrow band uh, imaging or not. And yep. I still am doing it, so I don't use this camera anymore. And uh, there's my first star cluster, which is uh, uh, aside from you know that one right there. But uh, this is my first all-out star cluster, the Pleiades, obviously. And uh, well, <laughs> I've been doing so much narrowband with this uh, uh, this uh, telescope. Uh, this was uh, went back to the uh, the Rebel T3i, and well, this is my very first cluster with this uh, telescope. So I've had it for a while, never did do an all out uh, open cluster. Uh, I was going to try in 13 last night, but just, you know, things got in the way. But uh, anyway, so here's my first uh, galaxy. That's in 33, of course, and Pegasus, again, Canon T3i. Uh, that's also, that's back in 2012, I remember that. Uh, this was uh, Mark Harry and Shane. I did this out at Big Woods and uh, did this on a weekday, so I told everybody about it. And I was out there all by my lonesome. And so, uh, but the thing I like about the Mark Herring chain is this guy down here because my dream is maybe one of these days when I retire, I'll have the capability to go to M87, which is this guy right here, and actually pick up that uh, that jet that comes out. Um, that's it's I forgot what kind of uh, particulates that is that's coming out of it. But anyway, uh, uh, from what I understand, somebody was able to get this show up on using a. Uh, an equatorially mounted dog, whatever that means. I always thought a dog was just on a turntable. You know, mount it. Why isn't it just uh, equatorial mounted Newtonian? But anyway, this is probably the most historic picture I've taken with it. This is, of course, the Venus Transit. Uh, I went all the way out to Albuquerque because here in Raleigh, you only got to see about maybe the first 30 minutes. Uh, I drove, so I drove two time zones over. I'd always wanted to see the Southwest. And I was like, okay, well, this is a great opportunity to do so. And so out there, um, statistically, well, it's in the Southwest, uh, it was going to be clear that day. And what's neat is that this, or I say it was going to be clear, this, uh, uh, the transit started about uh, somewhere between 30 to 40 degrees uh, above the horizon. So it had already, uh, you know, was pretty much in, in the afternoon and, uh, uh, so it was in the western half of the sky. The whole eastern half of the sky that day was clouded out. God, I was so lucky. <laughs> I was so nervous about it. I was like, oh my God, please just stay over there. And it did. So, okay. And uh, so that CAC filter I showed you earlier that uh, centers around uh, uh, 393 nanometers, that CAC uh, solar filter, this is what it can do. Uh, this was uh, uh, this year, I believe, uh, maybe March. I don't know, but there was a decent amount of uh, solar activity going on, on uh, that day. And so that was with the uh, CAC filter. Now with the uh, Herschel uh, filter, this is what you can get. Uh, this is kind of, uh, when you look through the Herschel uh, filter, I say Herschel filter, Herschel wedge, uh, you'll see that the sun is really, really bright. And um, so uh, you would want to use a polarizing filter if you're going to image through it. Now also you can get what's called a continuum filter and it filters around somewhere in the 400 nanometer uh, range. I can't, it's on the green side. So I can't remember what the, uh, what that wavelength is. But uh, anyway, that was on the same day as I took that one, obviously. And so this just goes to show you with the scope, uh, I've done all kinds of things with the scope. I've got filters for it, solar filters for it. I can do, you know, those two right there. Uh, then, uh, and as everybody remembers, the 2017 Eclipse, uh, yeah. Steve Kirchison was set up right next to me when I took this photo right here. So yeah, very memorable experience. So surreal. 
So anyway, so there's that. And then the lunar eclipse of uh, 2019. Um, so this is a little collage where I took some, uh, um, I did a, a whole time lapse of it, uh, an HDR time lapse. I'd always wanted to do that. So just to make a nice uh, pretty collage of you know, giving a, you know, an impression of how big the Earth's shadow is. I mean, this isn't totally accurate. Uh, but yeah, so I took some of the phases and made this little collage right here. And uh, uh, that was going back to the uh, uh, Canon T3i, whereas uh, uh, those two right there, obviously, that was with uh, uh, the ASI uh, what is it? 170? 174. There we go. Anyway, Canon T3i, Canon T3i. And uh, this, uh, remember at the beginning of uh, the slideshow, I showed you uh, an image of the horse head nebula that I took uh, with this scope by uh, using the Canon T3i. Uh, so what I did is I went back uh, late last year and uh, I took my SI 183 and did uh, some hydrogen alpha. And I didn't do bother doing any coloring, uh, coloring, so taking any color images of it because, well, I had already done that. So I went back to my 2011 color data and I combined it with 2020 data and this is what I got. So that was uh, one of the last images I have taken uh, with the scope. I haven't really done anything else uh, this year just yet. So that's kind of depressing, but I need to get on the ball. So anyway, okay, so uh, that's all I have. Chris, I have a question for you. What's up? You mentioned that you use that scope for solar imaging. Yeah. And you showed the Herschel wedge, <clears throat> but my question is, did you have an aperture mask on the front of the scope when you? No, uh, I feel like you were about to ask that. No. Uh, so the uh, model of, uh, they have two models, of course. They have one that's one and a quarter, and they have one that's two inch. So the two inch model, they say that uh, I think you're not supposed to go beyond 100 millimeters with it. Well, what I was wondering is, didn't the inside of the scope get pretty hot? No. No, it hasn't. I've never noticed it. I mean, it's, it's got a carbon fiber outside, so uh, maybe, um, yeah. I, I, actually, I did that just for fun. I took out uh, one of those little, uh, I guess, laser temperature things where you just point it at an object and it tells you what the temperature is. And yeah, I went up and down the scope and uh, yeah, it, everything, uh, at least on that day, um, was uh, below 80 degrees. Uh, of course, the back of it uh, right here where it says caution may be hot, uh, that was close to 100 right there. But no, I didn't have I guess any- That kind of makes some sense because <clears throat> the light is in theory just passing through the scope and is not impinging on any of the surfaces until you actually get to the back end. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know Jack about solar imaging. So that's the reason I was yeah, well, uh, yeah they, they say that you, you could get this all the way up to 100 millimeters. After 100 millimeters, you have to do what you're saying. You have to stop it down. Okay. So, but uh, I don't know about the one and a quarter. I don't know what's the uh, maximum aperture you can have with that for you to stop it down. Because, I mean, you can get to one and a quarter for this, but because it's smaller, it's going to concentrate all that heat much more than the larger one that we have that I have here. So, but anyway, uh, any other questions? No? Okay. All right. So let's see. Naveen, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, all right. Uh, hopefully everybody can see it. So I didn't take a whole lot of uh, pictures breaking down all the various components. So I do have a couple following this, but I've got a, <clears throat> my favorite and only scope. I got March this year because I'm pretty new to the hobby is the Zenith Star uh, 73, which is a f5.9. I've got the William Optics Flat 73A. So it's just a field flattener, not a reducer. On the back, the ASI 533 uh, MC Pro. I just added and finally this week got to try the uh, uh, focuser the autofocus are hanging off the side here. Um, guide uh, scope is a uh, William Optics Uniguide 50 millimeter with the ASI uh, 290 mm mini. Got the power box advance on the side with the, the temperature and humidity sensor. Um, 
And if you see underneath this yellow, I 3D printed a bracket that goes on. So the, the guide scope is on a handle on the top. So I just have the, a bracket that I printed that goes on the bottom to attach the power box advance to, and then uh, put a very simple <laughs> red dot finder off to the side of it to, to help um, with star alignment. Uh, when I started off, I had just a, an eyepiece in the back of the uh, guide scope, so a finder scope at the time. Um, and when I switched over, it was just yeah, the, <laughs> until I put this uh, uh, red dot finder on, which I, I had just laying around, first couple of nights it was, and, you know, kind of hunt and peck and try and figure out where I need to move the scope to, to align to a star. So that was a very low tech cheap uh, option for honing in. Um, I moved it over to this side. Originally it was on the other side, which you can't see, but there's knobs to hold the guide scope on. I had just clamped it on that and it was kind of fiddly because if I bump it, it might come loose. It wasn't sized properly. So, but now I've got a loop of wires that kind of get in the way occasionally. That's not too bad. Um, I didn't think to take a picture recently without this off. Uh, so I have a shelf liner around the field flattener, which is right in the front, uh, followed by some spacers, and then a ZWO filter drawer. Uh, so I can switch out the UV IR cut filter and uh, the uh, L Extreme uh, for narrow band. That's just supposed to keep out stray light. Yeah, because uh, actually, I'll so right here, you can see, I'll show a zoomed out picture as well because it was a fun little experiment. Um, but you can see the, um, the flattener right here in the front spacer and then the, uh, the filter drawer. What I found was when I first used this, it was um, a good amount of moonlight out. And um, there was some noticeable banding on some of the shots. So. I had a pair of halogen lamps in my garage. Uh, so I hooked it up, taking you know, effectively darks uh, with the light blaring on it to, to see what areas were leaking. And it's basically the whole thing. So <laughs> that's why it's such a wide uh, uh, thing covering up from, basically from the, where I, the rotator uh, screw is back to the camera, I actually wedge it up underneath the wires and have this uh, uh, strap just as far back as I can go. I originally testing with some foil just around it to block and see what, what made a change. And it's not like a massive amount of light coming in, but it was enough that I uh, just run with it on. It, it's, um, let me go back. Uh, can't see here, but these two staples here are holding on a, a Velcro uh, tape, just the staples to make sure it doesn't come loose. And it's it's easy to, to pull on and off and get to the filter drawer. Um, other things, so I've, I've, everything is as compact as I can get it. So I have one bundle of wires coming off. It includes three cables, one for the 12 volt DC power coming in, one for, uh, mount power coming out and then one USB three, the blue cable heading to the PC laptop, which is under my high tech uh, uh, do control box on the table back here. <laughs> um, I keep telling kind. myself I'll get something else, but <laughs> eh, it works. Is there a question? No, I said that's the best kind. I wouldn't spend yeah. a penny more. That's all it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only thing, it's gotten kind of damp occasionally. I thought about uh, taping the top of it up completely, but then I'm going to have water running off when I lift it up. So I'll kind of, I'll probably leave it as it is until it falls apart. So that's my scope. Um, first light with the scope was in March. I, this, the only time I've gotten any time on M45, um, it was with the unmodified Canon I originally started off with until my wife decided to take it back and do photography herself. Um, I had no guide camera, no filters, no power management, no autofocusing. So 
um, this kind of is what I got. I've, I've reprocessed this so many times as I've learned more and more about what I'm doing right and wrong. So this is my latest <laughs> rendition. And I got the ASI uh, 533, the day of the supermoon in April. So um, that was pretty cool. First target to shoot with that I got. Well, I think this is, yeah, I put it on here, 800 frames at about 0.3 frames per second. Uh, taken, you know, surrounding when it was at its uh, largest, so. And then we've had a lot of time with galaxies of late. On the left, I, I keep adding data to these over time. I've got um, M51 with a bit over six hours of RGB and four and a half with the L extreme. I'm just pulling out the uh, red for AJ. And then pinwheel um, combination of no filter and then the UV IR cut once I finally added that. I haven't gone back and reprocessed like I'm looking at this <laughs> when I was putting this deck together and thinking, yeah, I really need to take another swing at it. But um, we'll see. I'm getting a little, I'm hopeful to get some more, more data tonight because the nebula I want to shoot is not going to be up until later. And then I've been working on uh, elephant's trunk. Uh, so on the left, there is a uh, OOH version of it. Um, it's six and a half hours from the L extreme. Um, I'd like to add some more. Uh, I'm, I'm Michael, you've mentioned you know, getting more O3 on stuff. I can definitely tell there's a difference in how much O3 is in that uh, uh, object versus the HA. And then on the right, the Eagle Nebula, uh, uh, taking the L extreme and, and RGB data and combining it. And then masking like crazy to try and do something interesting with the core. How late did you have to stay up for that Eagle Nebula? Uh, let's see, I was shooting that probably mid last month, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, so I, I'm using Nina and everything's automated. So I set it up, probably I was taking shots of uh, pinwheel until Eagle Nebula, Nebula cleared my neighbor's roof. Switch to that, take, take uh, Eagle Nebula till it hit my roof, and then going to um, uh, Elephant's Trunk. So, so you were sleeping, if, is what you're saying. I was sleeping unless yeah. my system paged me like it did at 3 <laughs> or 1.30 this morning. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's what I got. Those are nice. So you, you know, it's interesting in three months, you've, uh, converged to the solution that most of us took some more time to get to, which is the, everything mounted on the scope and you just drop it in there, plug in a few wires and you're ready to go. So, uh, yeah, you got, got a nice setup there. Thanks. I've had a lot of fun with it. It's it's been a lot of uh, work to figure out what what was going to um, check boxes for for me being efficient. Like I I also have the mount sitting out in the backyard. I've decided I'll take the scope off and mm -hmm. just uh, because I can park it and take it off and not let it bake in the sun. With the I still have the three sixty cover over the mount, but um, right. Yeah, yeah. When it gets this hot, I always took it off because. The cover helps, but there's a lot of heat that still soaks through it. But uh... yeah. yeah, the one thing I'm thinking about doing is getting the um, reducer, which is a, a 0.8 mm -hmm. reducer would take it down to like a, a 350 focal mm -hmm. length. That's a good focal length. Yeah, we'll see. Well, that's pretty good to me. Yeah, three months. Yeah. Something like that would take me three years. <laughs> <laughs> or at least that was kind of like a Maya path right there. So that well, anyway. just shows we're good at teaching people, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I have an obsessive personality. I don't know. <laughs> I barely knew who Michael Fulbright was when I started. <laughs> the only person's photos I ever looked at were uh, Mark's. So but I was like, yeah, who's this Fulbright guy? It was like Michael Fulbright and what's better, Michael uh, Fitzgerald. 
Robert. Yeah. Oh, Robert. Excuse me. Yeah, Robert. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. So who's up next? Uh, who was it that was going to? Oh, yeah. Ron. Ron. Uh, you ready to go? Ron, perhaps? Did sure. You? Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Let's, let's look here. Hold on a minute. Uh, okay. Here we go. So I, I made a little PowerPoint just so I would sort of, I would try to organize my thoughts. And so really uh, this is a, mostly about Newt and, and Timmy. I tend to name the scopes. So I have three scopes, Stella, Newt and Timmy. And Stella is a, uh, a uh, 120 millimeter uh, stellar view. It runs at F5.2, Newt is, uh, uh, an antique uh, Orion 8 inch F5. And uh, Timmy is a uh, 80 millimeter with a Loma, Russian Lomo objective uh, TMB that I bought from Michael many, many years ago. Uh, so the, they're, but they're all at fairly high resolution between 0.65 and 1.7 arc second a pixel with the camera I use. So, so Ron, I take it that you're a fan of aliens. Ah, uh, yeah, I suppose so. What the heck? Well, anyway, everything has a soul, you know. It must be a Buddhist. Well, I named my telescope, my big uh, SCT, I named it Robinson after uh, the family name from Lost in Space. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, a general overview of, of this, and that is nothing rides on the OTA. Uh, all cables route through the mount. So swapping OTAs is really simple. You take one off, you put one on. So through the mount, I have a 12 volt for camera and I have a 12 volt that is either a do or a mirror fan. It depends on the OTA I'm using. One USB for the camera, one, another USB for the guider and a flat phone cable for the uh, focuser. Now, before I got the Mach 1, I did keep a power block hub and focus stuff on the OTAs. But I found through the mount is much easier because the electronics are sheltered and never disturbed. And of course, cable snag is pretty much impossible. So I started doing this long before I had a dome and I did it really for the integrity of the equipment. When I lived in Colorado, uh, the thing I really didn't expect was Gee whiz, uh, it's nine degrees Fahrenheit. Why did my USB quit working? And when, when these things are riding up on the OTA, it tends to happen much more often. So I started sheltering things in a box just to keep them warm and keep them alive. And a side benefit was if it rained, it really didn't matter on the electronics. Um, so, well, cable routing, well, how does it work? Um, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty simple thing. There's ports on the front and the back of the mount, and that's the cables that come out. In this case, noose on there. So out the back, I have another cable. In this case, it's going to a little fan for the, for the mirror. And you see the real high-tech mirror fan. It's mounted on a piece of cardboard, so it won't be uh, uh, um, you know, vibrating. And it was stuck on with double-sided tape in like 2012, and it must be good tape because it's still there. Now, a small, another detail that comes up is that uh, the thing I hate the most are the stupid 12 volt bar barrel connectors. What a hideous way to transport power. And it's easy to do that on one end, but I really don't wanna cut into the camera and modify that. So what I found to solve the problem is I have a piece of folded paper and a bolt and to a convenient screw hole is on two sides of the filter part of the camera. It just secures that. So no matter what goes on, the power stays on. Okay. So that's pretty clean, pretty simple setup. So uh, this is uh, a picture of the camera itself uh, mounted. So it's a QSI. And inside of that, there's eight filters inside living in, inside of there. So I've got a, a, a gray cable here that powers the focuser. I have a USB for the main camera and a power for the main camera and a USB for the guider. So I bought new around 2003 for $299 from Orion. It was an eight inch F5. And now before I did anything, I flocked the interior with some, some of the, some really hideous 
tape, I mean, glue stick flocking paper. Once it touches, it's on forever, but the inside was no longer reflective. First thing I did is I got rid of the fat focuser and put a moonlight motorized on there. And a key part of this that's been a theme for stability with the Newtonians is where the blue arrow is. There's a mounting block here for the focuser. And there's four little teeny tiny screw bolts that go through the OTA metal to hold that thing on. Well, put decent size washers behind those screws. It makes a real, real difference because you can actually tighten them up a lot because this is thin steel and you know it, it's not going to really uh, help you much if you tighten the screws against bendy steel. Now, the, the first fix I did that was the most dramatic for this scope uh, cost uh, maybe a dollar and 40 cents. And that is uh, collimation continually shifted with the OTA. You know, you blame everything, you blame gravity, you blame the mirror, you blame the clouds. And in actual fact, it ended up that it was nothing more than the cheesy nuts, bolts here that are holding on the spiders. And so these are tightening into sort of a hole drilled in this steel can. So one day I must have had the right kind of beer and I went to Ace Hardware and I bought four really big fender washers. I bent them so that they matched the tube uh, curvature, tightened it up real, real good. Well, on, honest to goodness, uh, collimation hasn't moved in years now with this scope. And this includes picking it up, throwing the case and bringing it inside the house and out. So it's rock solid. So with the scope, if the night has stable temperature, focus really doesn't move at all after a few hours of running. So that simple fix, I think is a really key thing for these out of the box Newtonians. Um, now the second fix was to refigure the mirror. That was a big decision to take and a scary step to take. Well, the mirror was okay, but when I looked at David Suter's uh, star test book, it said nothing terrible was wrong, but focus felt when I used it visually was soft, moving to focus from one direction and crisp from the other. And I figured that really can't be right. And you couldn't make any sense at all of the, of the out of focus, you know, inside or out. So I sent the mirror to Steve Swayze in Oregon, and that's his website, SwayzeOptical.com. And in a minute, I'll show you the shipping mirrors is absolutely trivial once you ask Steve how to do it. And so what the deal is, is for 50 bucks, he'll evaluate the mirror and he'll tell you everything about it. And he'll also tell you, I can make it better or there's nothing I can do for it, period. If he can do something for it, that 50 bucks goes towards his refigure. The total cost of the refiguring was like $200. That was it. And the recoat, he, he drop ships it to Miami to do the uh, uh, coating and the mirror comes back. So how do you ship a mirror? Well, here's just a FedEx random box. I have no idea what it was. I laid a mirror on it today just so you can see the size of it. So what you do is you take three pieces of wall insulation and in one piece, you cut a hole so that the center is a snug fit. You put one piece of the wall insulation underneath, you slide the mirror in there with soft paper on the other side and you put the other piece of insulation on top. Man, you can drop it 40 feet, it won't hurt. It's really, really simple to ship a mirror that way. And that works real well, probably up to like 14 inches. Now, this were the sort of the first images that I got out of Newt uh, after I did the mirror we work. I was really pleased and happy. It's like, holy cow, I got sharp stars and they stay sharp. So uh, the, on the left is M109. And there's, of course, you know, there's a super, super bright star here. And I kind of like the glow of the blue star floating into the field. I thought that was really kind of cool. And I'm obsessed by little tiny galaxies there. You guys know that. Another one was M106 here. And if you look carefully at M106, you can kind of see that there's all kinds of little flat fielding issues and artifacts in here. And the gradients weren't all that terrible. And so uh, what, what what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, I had been imaging uh, all before that using a Bader MPCC, which is the only coma collector there was for a long, long time that I knew about. And it worked pretty well. But um, it, 
I had a chance to borrow a Teleview uh, um, uh, paracore from a guy in Kingsport, Tennessee for a while. And I, I really liked it for a lot of reasons, but I really hated it for others. The first thing I didn't like about the Teleview at all was it altered focus position. So I had spent a whole lot of time and trouble to make the focus on this Newtonian be really, so the mirror, the, the, the chip would be close to the OTA and suddenly you put a focal, you know, a coma corrector on there to where you got to move the main mirror. I said, I hate, don't like that. And it also increased the focal ratio. Instead of F5, it was, you know, F5 and a half or more. So what I found was that telescope services offered a uh, 0.55, 9.5 coma corrector. Doesn't alter focus position at all, not even a millimeter. It's scary. It reduces the focal length by 0.95. The camera side is 48 millimeter here. So here it is mounted on there. The other thing I found out that makes a huge difference with uh, flat fielding and uh, uh, off axis thing is this thing, uh, two inches, it completely fills the draw tube of the scope. So there's no internal reflections in the draw tube that bounce and find their way into the optics. And internally, this is really well baffled. So it's like having a really nice, cool uh, uh, refractor with good baffling on the front end is the coma corrector. So it's about the half, half the cost of the Teleview coma correctors. It covers full-size chips, works between F4 and F8. And if you look at the spot diagrams, it's pretty much, it's identical to the Teleview. So I gave it a try and man, I love this telescope services coma corrector. Um, they say it's good for a full size chip. Well, looking down, this is the picture I took the other day. I just went out and opened the shutter and I held my camera up and pointed it down and took a picture. So this is looking down and you see, uh, you're looking down the, uh, uh, um, there's a eight inch, um, um, do thing extending the uh, front of the scope about a foot or more. And inside you see the flocking, but you see these little rings and these rings are of course baffles. And I, I looked at, um, you know, some Newtonian designing things and looked at what diameters of baffles you needed and where you went to get them. And I went to the hobby store and bought some cardboard tube and a nice little uh, a circular cutter and I cut them out and glued them in. And so now what's astounding is with the Newtonian, I can image really close to the moon and I don't get off axis problems in light. And before I did the changes of having, you know, the extender and the baffles and all, and also the, uh, the telescope services coma corrector, anywhere within 60 degrees of the moon was impossible. In other words, you just pick up the stray light bad. So that was a simple fix that worked really well, you know, piece of cardboard. So this is sort of a typical nude image. Uh, I took this last summer. I don't really remember. Um, nowadays, uh, it's the Tulip Nebula. It's coming up in the summer. So it's an RGBLH. And what I'm really happy about here is that it got the, the shock wave. So if you look right here in the image, there's a really funny little feature. And what that is, is the shock wave from the, uh, super, from the Cygnus X1 supernova remnant, which is living in this area somewhere. And that's kind of a hard thing to see because the contrast is so low and it showed up easily. Uh, another image that I really like with Newt was some time ago, uh, this is Abel 39. So this guy is pretty small. It's about 155 arc seconds in diameter. So it's an RGB HO. Um, it's, it's really an interesting uh, uh, planetary because it's about uh, two and a half light years in diameter. And it's the largest diameter planetary that's known that is essentially a perfect sphere. So it's something that's been studied a whole lot. And if you look through it right here, there's a little spiral galaxy and there's another galaxy up here that you can kind of see through it. So um, uh, that, that works. So Newt has good contrast and he can do okay. So now, I just want to tell everybody just right quick before I forget is yeah, that other picture of Abel 39. Yeah. Uh, 
just so you know, that is in Hercules. And it's funny, it's like last meeting, I was going to ask if anybody had uh, taken a shot at that, because that's something I would want to it's, go after. It's, but. it's really fun. Uh, it, it has, I mean, of course, it's RGB, but it has, of course, pretty good oxygen sensitivity there. H is a waste of time, frankly, on it. The, the, the hydrogen alpha, but RGBO would be really good on it. it, it it's a nice object. Um, How much time do you have on that one? Whew, uh, I think that was probably 20 hours. Total. Yeah, I was going to say, it's it's not bright. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's very dim. I think it was like a total of 20 hours over a couple of months off and on, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. That's on it. good. Now, the, all the, like I say, no electronics rise on the mount. So where do they live? Well, they live in now, they live in this box. So this box sort of sits on the ground. And there's a push pull small fan in here that runs off of a, of a thermostatic switch to keep air circulating in there. Uh, even before I had the dome, I did the electronics exactly the same way, only I had a much smaller container and it sat on the ground right beside the mount. And uh, so they were protected from dew and all that stuff. And I only had the cables that went up and then around, routed through the mounts. So when I was not going to image, uh, if it was going to be clear for you know several days, I just threw the 365 cover over everything, including the, the e-box, just left it out there. And, and it made it really, really simple to go. Well, this radio thing here is the Davis Weather Station. So this is the e-box. Um, it also, it, it keeps them safe from critters too, which is reality when you build a facility and put stuff in there. So ratty rat, rest in peace. Um, the other side benefit I didn't expect is inside I have a temperature, I have a little sensor of this temperature and humidity. I noticed that the humidity inside of this box is drastically lower than the humidity inside the dome. And the reason for that is that the air is circulating with the fans when it is warm, and there are a couple of small core pieces of electronics that run in there all the time. So there's a little bit of small heating and it keeps things dry. So I've been, I've been happy with that. But a small uh, like plastic toolbox with all the electronics in it works pretty handy to do this. And so even if I were travel out in the field, that's exactly what I would do. I have a small toolbox. I put three or four things in, you know, the, the focus uh, driver and all that. And, and, and the cable in the mount would just stay in the mount. So this is probably the hardest image I ever tried with new from, from a location like this. It's uh, NGC 7129 RGBLH. I have, th th this just seemed to run off and on with a bunch of other targets forever. It's a hard, hard thing. I, I really should have shown it blown up in the middle because these little Hertz objects with the little, the little sickle size bright red things are very, very cool. Well, I wanted to show the whole field of view with the red over here, which is kind of hard to see. And also my nice light gradient on this side, which I couldn't, couldn't really fight. So that's probably the hardest thing I did with Newton. That was maybe, I think it was last summer. Now, recent images, I did a lot of, a lot of galaxies, and, um, and this one is, is a field I had, don't see much. It's the main one is NGC 4321. This guy also has a, a, a nice NGC name. I don't remember. Uh, it, it's, it's a fun field to image. There's lots of detail. It's sort of like, this is sort of the size of M51, if you will, and there's a whole lot of little faint guys in there. So I, I was real happy to get this was just one of several galaxy stuff. Uh, the last image I did with Newt before I took him off the mount yesterday, this is sort of a pixel peep look at uh, M101. I've been trying to do this one deep and, and all. And so uh, you can see looking at the core in here that the, the 8 inch F5 can catch pretty good detail. Uh, all in all with hair. And so this is a lot of time on it. So it's nice and stable. Lots of little galaxies in here. That's one of my favorites here. There's some over here. There's probably, I've counted probably 300 galaxies in this, in this field um, all in all, but, uh, but that's just sort of the last project. So I took Newt off yesterday to get ready for some bigger stuff. And then I'm about done here, one more slide here. So this is Timmy, this is the TMB that I bought from Michael. 
And what I, uh, in a word, uh, it's the best optics I've ever seen, period. And I've owned, I've owned astrophysics refractors. I've owned stellar view, uh, uh, um, fluorite uh, optics. This Lomo evidently was a Russian optics company and they make all of the optics for the Russian military. And uh, back uh, before Putin came in power, they used to sell uh, optics commercially, but now since Putin arrived, they, don't, they no longer sell uh, commercial you know, optical lenses and stuff. It's all for the Russian military. So it, it's unbelievably nice glass. The only changes I did to the scope was I rolled up a piece of flocking board and put it inside of the OTA and I put a moonlight on there. So this is the setup of this scope. And all I really do is flip the deck around. And so now the, the, the USB for the scope instead of the front of the Newtonian comes out the back for the refractor. And, and the, the power for the dew strip uh, runs up to up here out the front rather than to the back for the fan for the Newtonian. And this is a, a two frame uh, mosaic I took with this last uh, winter, I think. Last image, um, this is the, the, my favorite image taken with Timmy. And this one I took from a dark site. Of course, it's the Angel Nebula. It's really hard to process because the stars are so super bright and there's all kinds of detail in here. And uh, from where I live now, this would just be impossible. But from a dark site in New Mexico, this is only five subs of each color. That's all it is. And from here, it would just be impossible to do. And so I would have gotten a whole lot more data, except the problem was, you know, clouds uh, sort of spoiled the week. So that's the story of Timmy and Newt. And uh, uh, any, any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. When are you going to sell it back to me? Ooh, uh, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the, that TMB is really nice. And being at uh, 377 millimeter, yeah, it, yeah it's, it, it, it's a convenient size. I, it's the only I, scope I, I ever regret selling. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. You, you, I, you, you were, there were tears in your voice <laughs> when we talked about a month later. I mean, I think that with a camera like a ASI uh, 294, and, and that particular OTA, it would open up one heck of a lot of field of view. Mm -hmm. and, and the resolution would be uh, outrageous. Yeah. I can go real quick, Chris. I decided to put something together if, if, you, if we got time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it's real short. Okay, go for it. All right. Uh, if I can do this. Um, which one is it? Uh, probably that one. All uh, right, is it sharing? Yeah. All right. So, since someone has my true love, I have my second love, which is the uh, Canon two hundred millimeter. Uh, which I sold F back to you, by the way. Which he he did sell back to me. By the way, you shipped it back like hardly with any foam or anything in it i'm amazed it still works but no uh so i bought this literally uh june maybe may of 2009 and this was the original incarnation uh bit of a frankenstein as most of my stuff is um old robo focus motor with a belt uh with this rubber band keeping some tension on it very precisely and uh this really stout uh, guide scope over here with a Mead DSI uh, high resolution guide scope. Yeah, this is this is the way things were a decade ago. You couldn't just go buy all these things uh, from ASI real cheap and throw it together. You kind of had to do it yourself. But uh, it's 200 millimeters. Uh, it's f 2.8 natively. I usually ran it at uh, between f 3.3 for narrow band and maybe f 4 for RGB. Uh, this is an old SXV H9 two megapixel camera on the back that I got in 2003 for three and a half K. So uh, anyone who complains about how expensive cameras are now can shove it. Um, this is an FLI uh, eight 
uh, five position, two inch filter wheel. Uh, so this, I wouldn't call it a state of the art 12 years ago, but for the price point, most of us could operate it. This would probably be what you're working with. And uh, yeah, I'm not, let's see here. So this was kind of a first light. It's probably about an hour of HA. Uh, now this um, one was using an FLI ML8300. That's a KF8300 camera FLI was selling. That sensor is about the same size as the ASI 1600. And, uh, you know, I liked it because with the 200 millimeter focal length, it gave me a five degree field of view, which uh, is kind of, I think, a kind of a magic number. Three degrees is another magic number that lets you do things like Andromeda and some of the bigger nebula. So that gave me a nice capability without having to do any uh, mosaics. Uh, so this image uh, is from June 2nd, 2009. And Mr. Ron and I were up at Dalton Park when I took this. Uh, Ro 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 I can't pronounce it. <laughs> That's up. I remember last night I was sitting out on a deck looking at Scorpius and uh, m4 down here uh, it's a nice region and that's uh something you know i could finally start doing with uh i had a bigger sensor and shorter focal length and i was able to start getting some of these bigger areas um so more recently uh i bought it back this is actually a canon 200 millimeter i don't have a picture of the i mean a 100 millimeter i don't have the 200 millimeter on here but the idea is the same i switched to this big uh, Cassidy tandem bar that probably weighs more than the Mach 1 it's sitting on. It's very stout and uh, have the, the lens and the ASI 1600 and then this kind of homemade uh, 50 millimeter guider with these really fancy wooden uh, guide rings. Uh, so this is uh, about a five dollar stepper motor I got off Amazon. I think nowadays you get five for ten dollars and I had this little lens gear which you wrap around the lens and it gets kind of tight on there and then it has a matching gear. So it's really easy to focus uh, the lens with that. Ooh. And so Mike, you call that a lens gear. I mean, that's what they call them. Um, you can't see it, but on the other side, there is a, a slot with a screw and you basically pull it around and slide it into the slot where it's tight. And then you tighten the screw so it doesn't come apart. Um, and it's a very sticky kind of, not sticky like tape, but just a rubber that with a lot of friction. So if you get it on there, it doesn't slip. Um, and it gives you, you like a nice- a, a plate uh, or a, you know, a place where you got that from? Like, um, just go on eBay and search for lens ring or lens gear. You'll see 8,000 of them. If you can't find one, let me know, but there- Chris, you can buy them all day long on BH photo video. Okay. Yeah, you can get yeah. it anywhere. A lot of times I, I found stuff like that looking for follow focus. Mm -hmm. That's a good one too. That. Uh, here's the back end of it. Here's a little nano, uh, Arduino nano and the little controller board. So for five bucks, I got the stepper and the controller board. And then I just wrote some code for this to drive it. And uh, yeah, it's sitting on this nice astrophysics, but uh, this is kind of the setup. So it's real simple. I just pick the whole thing up, drop it down on there and it's ready to go. Wait a minute, that's a Starshoot Autoguider? Yeah, it's an older, I replaced that. Oh my that gosh, that's that. still around? <laughs> yeah, uh, this or, picture I mean, from uh, 2016, I think. But uh, So here's uh, one of the pictures. This is uh, CMEs, uh, I think I said that right, 147. Uh, it's a big, something I've always been, spaghetti nebula, I think is what people call it. Uh, it's probably pushing 30 some hours of HOO. Um, so it's five degrees across. So it's a it's a big region, and I got it all in one shot with this setup with the ASI 1600. Um, let's see, here's the seagull. Uh, same idea, just a bunch of HOO data. I, I tend to do Michael. HOO Michael, mode. these are still the with the 200 millimeter or the 100. Yes, yeah, the 100 was simply the. That's the only picture I had of things like in my current setup. I would swap between the 100 and the 200. But honestly, that 100 is a garbage for astronomy for some reason. Um, the 200 is immaculate. Um, let's see, here's a M31. So this gives you an idea of your field of view with, a, with the 
like the TMB 80 uh, with a reducer, uh, you know, your field of view would just fit M31 if you, you slid it in there sideways. Um, so this gives you a little room to work with. Um, oh, and here is, oop, let's turn that off. Uh, so this is a lobster. The bubble is hidden in here somewhere. M52 is down here. And uh don't remember this region, but this is another one I took last year. This is SHO. But again, it you just you get you can just gather up such huge swaths of the sky. It's really nice. And uh yeah, and I did the M87 jet with it also. No, I was gonna show this to Chris. This was with the C8 last year. You can get the, the jet if you work on it. Um pretty okay. easily. Uh, I'm not at your site there. Yeah, well what's the time that you got did you do this from your house then yeah oh okay um, wow let me uh see if i can get back to the uh, oops uh to the technical card what did i do uh yeah so it's this rgbl uh total of about three hours a bunch of short exposures so uh yeah i mean it's it's nothing magic about it. Yeah, I had no idea. It, it's not like doing Einstein's, you know, ring or, or, or cross or any of those uh, gravitationally lens things. Now those are tiny. Um, you'd need great seeing for those, I think. But this is this is pretty big, relatively. So, yeah, you you could probably pull it off if you have with your if you still have your C nine and a quarter. Uh, actually, uh, that I went up to C eleven. So. Oh, right, right. So even better. <laughs> That's all I had. Cool. Okay, very good. Uh, well, uh, I think I'll oh, do it me, for, uh, 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 as far you. as uh, people presenting their um, scopes and whatnot. Uh, but uh, 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 we're getting to, so we're done with the uh, uh, presentations here. So we're on to, uh, I guess, the uh, uh, presenting of new images. Uh, if anybody uh, who did present uh, uh, their uh, telescope setup, does anybody uh, want to show off their images or have something else to show? Steve, why don't you talk about your new camera and M81? Uh, yeah, well, this is the first slide of the ASI 2600mm, just luminosity just two nights ago, because I just got everything working. And my problem is the, the uh, filter wheel that I have on there, the 36 millimeter filter wheel, had some uh, definite light uh, coming in. And I was getting flats and darks, so I was getting all kinds of light. And so I, I finally figured out where it was coming in, and I fixed that. So tonight I'll try and see if I can do something better. This is about 30 minutes of one minute exposures on an M81. It's literally the first thing I shot with two nights ago. So that's really all I have of it right now. This is on the Stellar View 102. Uh, so um, I'll keep working. But I, I'd say I've had two days with it. So I'm still waiting for my narrow band filters for it because those still haven't shown up yet. So we'll see when those come out. What'd you buy? Uh, Astrodon, uh, okay. three, three okay. nanometer Astrodons, 36 millimeter filters, terribly expensive. Yeah. Three of them, it's very expensive. Steve, did you yeah. intend to show us a picture? What's that? Did you intend to show us a picture? No, it's what's behind me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I missed that part. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, you got to share your screen to show that. Okay, never mind picture I've taken with it that was two nights ago and I'm going to try some other things tonight now I've got the light leaking figured out uh, but I couldn't do flats or dark since I was getting light leaking it was just killing those so aluminum foil is your friend well there's that possibility as well but I, <laughs> I figured out where it was coming from I just brought it in and aimed light at it uh, <laughs> and, and covered things up until I figured out where the light was coming from and then I covered that up and now it's not doing that anymore. So I'll be able to do flats and darks. I don't really need to do darks with this camera. Because there's no, I, the darks I took of it after, with my testing, there's nothing there. There's no. Which camera is that? What's that? Which camera? 
ASI 2600 mm. Ah, gotcha. AKSC sensor one. So, awesome. Just to get it, but I've got it fine. <laughs> I'm still waiting on the narrow band filters. So, I'll, uh, I'll keep at it. Yeah. Okay. okay so I want to share something for about five seconds. Okay, go for it. Just to right. show uh, uh, the, this, this good old story about imaging. Uh, we're, we're looking at the uh, radar scene. Of the, the, the cursor here is my house. <laughs> and, 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 and weather moves northwest, northeast, right? Well, look at this storm right here. It knows I was going to image tonight, and so it's homing in <laughs> on us. And I mean, this is a small storm for Texas. It's about as wide as North Carolina is. Okay, and so uh, I can hardly wait. It's going to be arriving any minute. Yeah, you could. Well, no, the uh, we're still at twilight here, I guess. So <laughs> yeah, you're one uh, time zone over. So it's probably yeah, you probably have to wait another two hours before it be really dark. Yeah. Okay. Michael, I like the solution for the focuser on the uh, lens, the camera lens, the find of that, uh, the, the sort of the stick on gear yeah. part. That's really a, a great thing because, in my mind, it makes all those lenses really usable. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, does anybody else have any uh, images they would like to show? No? Okay, so uh, yeah, just go for a couple of things. First off, Ron, I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, what's his name? Um, Roland's not here tonight. Uh, but were you guys uh, uh, up for uh, doing your presentation in July about uh, uh, the uh, image that you put together of the uh, Dolphin Nebula? Sure. Yeah, Roland and I will did that jointly, and it was a, a real interesting learning experience to try to do something like that. Yeah. You know, just how to how to organize it. And, or, or, or you just need infinite cloud space. That's all you need. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll look forward to that. And uh, okay, so uh, as you saw uh, in the email a few weeks back, uh, we talked about uh, uh, what exactly we want our future imaging needs to uh, to look like. And so, for the most part, we're uh, gonna. Uh, Continue what we're doing now, but uh, we'll get to <clears throat> excuse me. We'll get together at a uh, I guess a local eatery, if you will, and we'll do uh, uh, a meeting at that those places too every uh, quarter. Now, I think I mentioned in the last email when we uh, uh, since we all have uh, the majority had voted for uh, that kind of format that uh, I wanted to do this in uh, August. Actually, I probably would want to push this off to uh, September. Uh, uh, being kind of selfish, that's more for my uh, uh, for my sake because uh, uh, during the uh, August uh, uh, time slot for an imaging meeting, I will be out of town, and so Zoom would be better for me in, in that respect. And it'll give us a few months to uh, plan on how we want this uh, uh, quarterly meeting get together to be like. So, because the biggest thing I'm trying to think of right now, I mean, we're all used to Zoom, right? But uh, um, I mean, people can uh, give me some ideas of where to go with it because I don't know of any like all out reliable, not necessarily reliable, but uh, uh, what's the most common type of software you would use to record a meeting? And what I mean by that, not a Zoom meeting, but a recorded meeting. Because what I, my intent was for these quarterly meetings is that we all get together at, at whatever place we decide to go to and we have a regular meeting, but uh, we don't do it uh, uh, through Zoom. Uh, and that's mainly just because of, uh, if we go wherever we're going to have to go, it's going to have to have a good internet connection. I mean, I could just run it off my phone and hotspot it or, or, or whatnot, but uh, um, I don't know how reliable that will be. So that wouldn't be your issue. The issue would be you would use up every bit of data you had, either that or if you've got an unlimited plan, <clears throat> it would slow to a crawl. Yeah, see, that's what I'm afraid of. And so, I mean, I've gotten limited, but I'm just like, well, oh, God, I don't know about this. And people keep telling me, 
I mentioned this to, uh, with other people that aren't in astronomy who are more tech savvy than I am. They said that Zoom actually does not eat up very much uh, uh, data in the first place. So I'm like, I kind of find that hard to believe. I mean, but uh, if you, it, Chris, if you look, you could see, but right now it says it's using uh, about a megabyte. No, it's saying 1200 kilobits a second receive. And uh, so, you know, you can kind of, there's a, if you look in settings under Zoom and you look at uh, statistics, it'll tell you kind of what it's doing. And uh, I think you'd be surprised at how little it actually uses. And, you know, we got lots of people in the club with nice cell phone plans. So I'm sure one of us could <laughs> volunteer. Uh, diff there's only four meetings a, a year. So I think we could probably figure out how to distribute that maybe. Maybe yeah. I did this calculation wrong, but based on what you just said, Michael, that would be 72 megabytes a minute. That's, right. Okay. So I was just. Yeah, that's a little more doable. <laughs> yeah, so 4.3 gigs, not horrendous, I guess. Well, like I said, if we have the right people, the right plans, we can right. figure it out. Okay, so all right, so that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll make that uh, our first, I guess, actual in person get together um, in September. Uh, you know, given the current events of the world, uh, I don't really see anything becoming an issue from that. Uh, you know, doing it in September. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, three months away. So, I guess we'll see what happens. Uh, Anyway, okay, well, uh, thanks for all being here tonight, and uh, I guess we'll see you next month. Let's see what uh, what day is that going to be. Uh, so July, so second Friday is the ninth. So it'll be the 15th of July is when we'll have our next meeting where uh, Ron and or uh, uh, Ron, uh, Roland will give us a rundown of their uh, cooperative effort on the uh, uh, Dolphin Nebula. So. Hey, Chris, I got a question. What's that? Not for anybody else here, anybody planning on going to, uh, I will tell you that I have not read anything closely because I just signed on and started reading, reading the listserv for like maybe a week um, here, just a few minutes before the meeting, but I saw where somebody was going to organize an imaging, well, observing session out at Big Woods. I just recently saw that too. I, I haven't read into it. Just I was just curious if anybody's planning on going. Uh, well, uh, we have a, a member here tonight that was asking about that. I don't plan on going to that, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, that was something that we had talked about earlier, or Michael brought up because uh, we had done that a long, long time ago. At least uh, I only was at one a long, long time ago where we would get, you know, do get togethers out at like, say, Big, Big Woods or whatever. And uh, we bring out all of our imaging setups and uh, people would stroll around and look at what everybody's doing and if anybody had any problems or if anybody need, needed advice about uh, taking care of a uh, uh, situation where imaging could have been, have been done better, you know, well, you're set up right there. Everybody can give you your input. So, so anyway, okay. Uh, do what would you say? I, I was just curious. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, anybody else have anything? No? Okay, well, we'll see you next month, uh, July 15th. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.